So hi everybody, by the way, uh, glad, glad you're here. And and Jamie, you brought up just some memories in my mind. You know, from 2013 until 2016, I, I, I uh, worked with Ken Schreber and Scrum the Talk. And uh, at some point of time, um, we had this beautiful uh, guy working with us, David Starr, Dave Starr. And um, he was sort of COO, whatever, but he's like me, not too much into titles. And at some point we were thinking about trying to expand let's say, sort of our program. So, you know, we have professional scrum trainers. You know, we're thinking about, should we add something to that? Like something like, I don't know, professional scrum practitioners, something that people can uh, show to the world and help them sort of distinguish themselves. And I, I know at some point of time, just, just to make fun of it, I said, oh, well, let's introduce a new thing and let's call it Scrum Wizards. And and that was yeah. that was supposed to be a joke, and you know, now it seems like you're taking this seriously. <laughs> so it's, it's cool. Oh, just so, just for fun, don't be serious. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. A scrum wizard, so it's for uh, let's add that as a, as a role or a position, it, which is cool. <laughs> and that's another thing that uh, Jamie we were just talking about before uh, the session started, um, and I want to share that with people. You just said that you've got five speakers from Scrum Day Madison. So was there in September. Um, Jamie, you also shared, I don't know if that's a secret I'm giving away, but you also shared that you're considering setting up some sort of online event uh, with the Scrum Masters of the Universe. Um, and and I remember the beautiful event of Scrum Day Madison in September, uh, meeting lots of great people, a beautiful event. Now, and I also remind me, not all events are that amazing. I I feel like often, I'm probably too serious also, um, but I feel like too too often, too many events are about entertainment. And I, 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 I don't like that. I like entertainment, but in a way, not as a Scrum event. So, um I like to share information with people and not just stand on the stage and jump around and dance around and, and then people have a really fun whatever sort of time. And you know, like five minutes after the after your session, they would have forgotten what you've talked about. And that's something that I see so often. And it's so strange with event organizers. They're actually also looking for people like that. It's it, I've I've gone through strange things. So I've got this very mixed. Uh, feelings about events. Some of them are really great, but most of them are like, yeah, you know what? And sometimes I even wonder why they invite me. You know, if you get invited to come speak at an event and then you get sort of sidetracked on a little uh, back backstage somewhere where you get to talk for a few people out of all the people that registered, I sometimes wonder why event organizers even bother to, to I feel like, being a filler sometimes. But anyway, some, some things about events. But this is this is a great outcome of the event because at Scrum Day Madison, I remember Jamie and also Mark Metzer uh, talking to you guys, and uh, I shared my um, my not not a frustration but the, sort of the limitation of events, meaning you have to say what you need to say in about forty at most forty five minutes. If you like a really important person, that would be sixty minutes. So that never happens to me. So I always have to bring my story in forty minutes. And then I, I always feel I have to condense it. And I share that with, with you, Jamie, and said, you know what, come back to the Scrum Masters of the Universe and bring the full story. And that was my total ambition, to bring you guys the full story. And then um, I started working on it. And then I realized, oh, my God, it's not really the full story. It's almost the full story. But I'll, I'll come back on that. I'll, I'll at least give you a glimpse of uh, the things that are not uh, included. Otherwise, we'll never get done in about... Uh, uh, 90 minutes or so that we have. So thank you, Scrum Masters of the Universe, the meetup, Jamie, the leadership team for inviting me. Uh, thank you for all the people uh, joining us. It's uh, amazing, beautiful. Um, it looks like sort of my success rate at this event, let's say, is bigger than that last event. The last One of the last events I was, I think I spoke for about 40 people out of a total sold-out event of 1,100 people. So in, in terms of uh, people registering for this fund, it's about, I, I believe, about 220 people. So almost 60 people joining. So my success rate is really going up. Cool. Now, talking about moving your scrum downfield. 
I know if anybody ever been in a session of mine, I've shared this uh, so many times that I stopped doing that at some point of time. But here I live in Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, it's the Dutch speaking part of Belgium. And um, I, I work a lot at home. Um, I do still do a lot of online trainings and so on. And uh, this is a little wooden box I have in, in my office here in, in Belgium, my home office. Um, it's something that resonates with me a lot. It, it says life isn't about finding yourself. It's about creating yourself. Something I, 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 I truly love. And in a way, not just for life, but also for my beautiful world of, of Scrum and Agile. So, so if I would be literally translating this, it would be Scrum isn't about finding it. It's about creating it yourself. But I was uh, too easy. So I, I converted that a little bit into this text. Just a call to people. Don't sit around for Scrum or waiting for Scrum to happen. Go out there, play the game, make it happen yourself. In that sense, shape your Scrum yourself, your instance of Scrum. Don't sit around waiting for people uh, you know, this typical attitude, you know, you know, they don't get it and they don't do this and we don't get to do this and we're not a lot, whatever. Do something that you can do. Try to make to make the best out of what you, what you can. So it's a bit of a call to action. And why is that? Because it's something that I miss a lot. And this is the meetup of the Scrum Masters of the Universe. So we've got Scrum Masters from all over the universe joining us, um, entering with spaceships and so on, whatever, to be here with some sort of a very, very long distance connections, whatever. It's something that I miss. So please, 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 dear Scrum Masters of the Universe, be those people that are challenging the status quo. Something that I, I totally miss, not totally, but I miss a lot these days. And that's what I want to talk about. So please help um, moving your Scrum downfield by challenging at least the status quo. I think if 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 a Scrum boss would be sort of a product, you would ship it in a box. I think that should be the baseline on the box next to the, the product title Scrum Master, challenging the status quo so that if people open up the box, that they know what is going to happen. Their status quo will be challenged. And that's, I think, really, really, really important. But that's sort of a little bit of a start. This lady wants to continue. So what about getting to the point? So allow me to do that. In a little book I wrote, and it's actually 10 years ago. So in 2013, in uh, November 2013, it was published. I, I wrote it in, uh, in the spring of that year. Uh, that book was called Scrum, A Pocket Guide or A Pocket Guide to Scrum. Um, I, I updated the book in 2019 and again in 2021. Now, I kept in this, this is the last statement of the book, saying, expressing my belief, it's not just a hope, my belief, my conviction also, that at some point of time, Scrum will become the normal, the standard way of working. And at some point of time, it will be uh, so normal that organizations will have reinvented themselves reinvented themselves around Scrum, or what I call re-emerged around it. Now, that is... A little bit of wishful thinking so far. Um, I think we've got some work to do to make this actually happen. So uh, we, we, I believe that we need to shape our Scrum to make this actually happen. And as I was working on a fourth edition, so this is a school, big news. So I'm working on an update of my book. And as I was doing that, I was looking, I was looking at sort of uh, the chapters in which I try to describe sort of the past and and. Uh, past evolutions of, of, of HL, the HL movement and, and Scrum within it. Because my the previous statement is a, a final statement of the book. It's sort of looking forward. Now, in my book, I've also tried to describe the past of Scrum in HL. And I, I've used a model for that. It's called the Technology Adoption Lifecycle. It's by Jeffrey Moore. It's uh, It's got a couple of books out there. It's a famous book. is Crossing the Chasm and so on. And, and what is that adoption life cycle about? Jeffrey Moore had uh, identified at some point of time and described it in his books and, and models, whatever, that um, for specific, mostly disruptive technologies or technologi technological products, there's something different in the adoption of such a product versus a traditional classical whatever product. And, and let me explain. So uh, Jeffrey Moore found that also for highly disruptive innovative new products and new technologies. Um, it always starts with uh, the product being embraced and adopted and, and cherished by 
aren't just people that look out to be pioneers and so on. They don't care about, let's say, uh, is, is, is our, is our, are there still a lot of bugs or whatever in it? They just want to adopt the newest of the newest. So aren't you just uh, combined with visionaries? And that's sort of a, a phase in the adoption life cycle uh, that Jeffrey Moore, or that is called the early market. Right? So there's an early market where a new product out on the market is only adopted by people that really believe in it, that want to try it out, that want to be those pioneers, that want to be the forerunners of uh, that new uh, product. Now, I believe that the technology adoption lifecycle also applies to Agile. Uh, Agile is a highly disruptive paradigm in our world. It's with, uh, started certainly with technology, there's still a lot in the world of technology. So, um, I believe this model applies also to Agile. Now, Agile, as we all know, uh, was in a way founded or born in 2001, Agile Manifesto. So that means that's sort of the early market phase of this thing. Now, what Jeffrey Moore found was different for highly disruptive technology products versus uh, traditional, classical, uh, let's say regular, more regular products, is that after the early market, there is a phase in the adoption of such a product or disruptive technology that it's very unclear what is happening. So that the product seems to go in some sort of chasm, some sort of black blocks, and, and nobody knows what hap what's happening. Yeah? Now, there are also products that never come out of the chasm, that disappear, that die somewhere in, in, in the chasm. But products that come out of it, are now adopted by what Jeffrey Moore calls pragmatists, uh, sort of the early majority, uh, people that are not interested in the, the fancy, whatever new stuff of it, but the potential use of it. Uh, and how that new thing might solve a problem that isn't being solved by an existing solution or an existing product. So pragmatists, people that are interested in this thing, and, and in uh, the pragmatist in the... Um, the market phase, let's say, the adoption phase that the product goes to is what Jeffy Moore calls the bowling alley. So there's a lot of bowling pins. So there are uh, versions of, the, of of different types of products and the different versions targeted at different markets and different audiences, solving specific solutions and so on. Now, I think uh, the world agrees and I've described in my book also, that around 2006, 2007, Agile as a new highly disruptive paradigm came out of the chasm. And suddenly it became widely spread and more widely spread than, than ever before. So it came out of the chasm. Now, I was just reading also, I don't know if anybody read it, uh, Jim Highsmith, uh, Agile pioneer, even, even from the, let's say, pre-Agile days already pioneering. So Jim Highsmith uh, recently published a book with sort of his, his personal memories, almost sometimes like his personal diary of his life and career in, in not just Agile, but in technology in general. And, and there was a, a fascinating thing that he brought up in his book. He said that actually in 2007, he relates the sort of the rise, the ascendance of, 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 of Agile methods and the Agile way of working. Um, he, he, he connects that to the rise of very important um innovations in, in the digital era, let's say, uh, like Facebook going mobile, the first iPhone being launched in 2007, um, GitHub was working on interesting uh, innovations and so on. And he just said there was this enormous boost in sort of digitalization, digital products and digital services and, and things going digital, that he said that is probably part of the explanation why Agile suddenly uh, came out of the chasm and, and started growing enormously. Now, um, the result of that bowling alley phase is that within the uh, different types of products that are trying to, to uh, achieve the same, in general, there's the outcome is that there's one gorilla product, meaning a sort of market leader. And he calls it a gorilla. Why? Because he uses it as a metaphor to say a gorilla is a market leader that is very difficult to overthrow. There's also the potential alternative model that's more like a king. Uh, there could be a king coming out of the bowling alley, but a king can be overthrown. You can, you can start a rebellion, a revolution against the king. You can overthrow the king, but a, a gorilla not or not so easily, at least. And and my point of view was in my book, and still is, by the way, that, that from after Agile 
crossed the chasm, uh, came out of the chasm. From all the agile approaches, Scrum is by far the gorilla. Uh, Scrum is the most adopted one. It sort of became sort of the standard. In that sense, it's it's the one to um, to join or to oppose. So a lot of the opposition against Scrum, in a way, since those days, in a way, is reinforcing the idea that Scrum is the gorilla of the agile method. Now, in my book, I also, uh, up to the, the, the previous edition, I looked down at that bowling alley, and, and it, it feels and it looks like a whirlwind to me. Now, I've been, uh, like, like some people said, I've been traveling the world uh, at events, working with people, doing classes sometimes. And, and I've tried to distinguish sort of what I call the waves of Scrum. And I feel like since Agile crossed the chasm and Scrum becoming that gorilla, part of it was Scrum being adopted mostly for IT purposes. Um, software development or just IT development uh, adopted by the IT parts of organizations. And then in the next Scrum wave, and every wave, for whatever reason, seems to be taking about five or six years. Now, it's not black and white, so there's no, no clear barriers or borders between them. But in the next wave of Scrum, um, it was fascinating to see that there was a lot of sort of divergence, uh, what I call sort of still derivative methods. Uh, people wanting to do Scrum, but not wanting to call it Scrum. People um, creating and launching new methods that looked a lot like Scrum, but still gave it different and whatever funny names. A lot of them also disappeared again. So there was a lot of divergence. But another core theme in that, that next wave of Scrum that I situate around 2010, 2011 until 2015, 16, uh, another theme was scale. And, and I remember working at Scrum to talk with Ken Schrader uh, around 2014. Uh, we, we gave birth to what we call the Nexus framework, uh, the, the, the framework for scale professional Scrum, because everybody know by that time, scale was thing. And it was part of that, that growth of Scrum because large organizations were also discovering Scrum and they also wanted to uh, apply and adopt Scrum. So they brought in this whole idea of scale. They also brought in this idea of hybrid things or renaming things and so on. It's also the period where the terminology of Scrum sort of went all over the place. At some point of time, you couldn't imagine a company anymore that wasn't working in sprints. You couldn't imagine a company that wasn't that didn't have product owners in place or a company that didn't have something like backlogs, but they sort of cherry picked elements of Scrum often. So that's again, sort of the divergence. And my hope in my book around 2021, uh, or I adopted it in 2020, was that uh, people would, after that, that wave of divergence and all over the place and sort of, sort of cherry picked terminology and, and that focus on scale and large things, I hope, because it wasn't really working, I hope that people would discover the simplicity of Scrum again, that in the in the first Scrum wave. Now, as I was working on the update of my book, I, I found out looking back and, and bringing all those uh, pieces of puzzles together of, of working, uh, by now working for 20 years with, with Scrum. Um, so, and I, I wanna share that. But let me first share what Jeffrey Moore says. After the bowling alley resulting in a gorilla, uh, a gorilla product, in our case, a gorilla method, uh, let's say Scrum, there's a phase called the tornado. Tornado is sort of, sounds very much like my whirlwind, I believe. Uh, very, very wild, very chaotic, lots of, lots of things happening. Yeah? Now, uh, to continue the story of the technology option life cycle, after the tornado, there's a main street, and I think it's, it speaks for itself, the term. It's, it's, conservatives, uh, people that would only adopt it because it's really uh, every, everybody's doing it and whatever sort of conservatives that have been waiting for a long time to adopt it as well. And in the end, there's this assim assimilation phase where, uh, where only laggards would still, uh, still uh, go for the new product. Now, as I was updating my book, I was also looking at this chapter in which I described this and looking at, we've had those three waves of Scrum. And I believe, I truly believe that we are entering the fourth wave of Scrum. And, and there's no way of predicting what it will be about. And I've updated my, my terminology a little bit. So the first wave of Scrum, 
that IT perspective to Scrum, IT adoption of Scrum, then the diversions and, 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 and core theme scale. And in the third Scrum wave, what has happened rather than embracing the simplicity of Scrum and going back to the essence of Scrum and, and the sort of the cohesion of Scrum, restoring the cohesion of Scrum and capitalizing on that, um, there was this wave of, of all these agile transformations. So uh, Scrum adopted as part of some whatever agile transformation. And I don't know how that is for you guys, but I haven't seen one successful agile transformation. I have seen lots of money spent. I've seen lots of people burned. I've seen lots of attempts to to uh, to adopt Scrum, but it always ends up in what I call industrializing your Scrum to death, forcing, imposing it on people rather than thriving on enthusiasm and 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 getting people to buy into that and and inviting them. And it was very much focused on the process aspect of Scrum, just working in sprints and so on. That is an achievement. So the waterfall process, in a way, has at least at the surface been replaced by that uh, iterative incremental way of working of Scrum. But that's about it. And I notice in a lot of companies, there's some sort of change or agile fatigue. Uh, people are getting tired of it. They've tried it at scale. They tried lots of things. They tried it with agile transformations and so on. So I hope, I hope that there are plenty of Scrum masters around the world and uh, Scrum practitioners that would be able to <clears throat> to stand up, challenge the status quo, and and share that message that there is a better way. There is always, there must always be, there is a better way, and help shape Scrum. And I believe that in that sort of entering that fault wave of Scrum around the world, sort of uh, generally, that uh, we have also we are also entering that tornado phase of the technology adoption life cycle. And what, what Jeffrey Moss also describes in that as typical to that tornado phase, that a lot of people will just keep on doing it. But the companies that will stick out are the companies that will uh, capitalize on the opportunity of, of using that new technology, that new product, in our case, Scrum, that impl a very specific implementation of that new agile paradigm as, as something that helps them drive forward to fundamentally, fundamentally rethink how they work and how to organize for that work. So in general, it's called new infrastructure businesses and so on. In, in, in this case, it's, it's what I hoped with my statement of my book, uh, re-emerging the organization around Scrum. But it's not happening massively, but that's also normal for that tornado phase. We, I hope that people uh, would stand up and, and help this shape this. And I think, honestly, that also uh, this sort of message is also why it is will not resonate with sort of the masses around the world that have adopted Scrum, because they're not interested in 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 being this sort of forerunner again of and standing up and pioneering, and and be driven by this ambition to get the most out of Scrum. Now, um, lady reminds you of the fact that I'm, I'm sort of ending with the conclusion, so let's start somewhere. And I think in the invitation uh, to this meetup, uh, Jamie, Anu, and so on, thank you. Uh, you've pointed out that in 2020, I wrote a paper. It was the beginning of the corona crisis in Belgium. We were in the middle of the lockdown situation. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Staying at home, not touching people, whatever. You can't see people, whatever. So my classes got cancelled. My consulting got cancelled because you couldn't come near to other human beings, uh, so to speak. Um, and even if wearing a mouth mask and so but a face mask. So I, I used that time to write a paper and I'd call that paper Moving Your Scrum Downfield. And that, that title was a reference to the old paper, 1986, where we got the name Scrum from. The new, new product development game. They call it Moving the Scrum Downfield. I think it also shows that they're not really, really uh, familiar or knowledgeable in the game of rugby, by the way. But I'm not. I'm not either. So uh, we can we can uh, just keep keep going with that sort of ignorance. So moving your scrum downfield. What I wanted to achieve by that with that paper is to help people see what scrum is about beyond the terminology, because people were using terminology and had no idea what it is. 
and then uh, also cherry picking. But what, I, what was even worse, and it still goes on, by the way, you have these sort of debates, um, war of words across the world on forums, LinkedIn and so on, about interpretations of the Scrum Guide. And by that time, I was so fed up with that, um, that I wanted to describe what Scrum is about, and I wanted to describe the six essential traits of the game. You're getting the most out of Scrum or you're really understanding Scrum if you're playing the game and you would respect that simplicity of Scrum. If you would respect Scrum's DNA, so beyond or, or underneath the process, underlying the process is what I call Scrum's DNA, the combination of empiricism, uh, inspection, adaptation, plus self-organization. So not just the process, but also the people aspect of Scrum. When you create an environment where players are, are willing and able and, and feel safe enough to actually demonstrate accountability, where you don't have to hold people accountable, tell them that they are responsible, where we create environments where people uh, spontaneously, almost proactively demonstrate that they can be accountable, that they are accountable. Where you use product backlog and all, all the work is prints to create transparency over the flow of value. When you close the loops, when you, when you thrive on feedback loops regularly, and not just, I, I mean with closing loops, not just the sprint and not just the daily scrum on top of the sprint, which is a feedback loop, but also uh, feedback loops within a sprint that come from your testing practices, from your engineering practice, from in general, how you do development, like test-driven development, to give an example, that is about creating feedback loops. So, so within a sprint, you should have this whole set of feedback loops to help you see, are we on the right way? Are we doing the right stuff? Are we building it also in the right way? And not just blindly follow the process and then and, and, and see what happens, but take matters into hand and where you uh, live and enact the Scrum value. So that was that paper, moving your Scrum downfield. I, I updated it slightly in September uh, of this year. Uh, but the essence is still there, six, six traits. Now, if you've been around for a while, so I wrote that paper in 2020, and then I found for myself, this is not nearly enough. Helping people see, helping people understand the six essential traits of the game, that's fine, that is important, but there is more, and there should be more. And then I thought back of the period of 2016, 2017, so I had uh, uh, stopped my exclusive work for, for Ken and, and Scrum the Talk. And I went out in the world again, in that sense, doing consulting and working with organizations, working with teams. And that was sort of the middle of that uh, wave of Scrum, where it was all about agile transformations. And I wanted to offer people an alternative to what already were a lot of failing agile transformations. I wanted to tell people to make it simple again, to make it small again, rather than the industrial approach to um, to transformations, uh, copy pasting what other people are doing, try to implement cookbook models and so on, and just blindly doing what other people are doing over time, some sort of cookbook was saying. So, and, and I call that reversify, to reversify, because it's a verb, it's something you do, it's an action, it's not a model. And the idea of reversify, I found this beautiful old English word, uh, reversify. Uh, the essence of it is to turn something into verse again. In that sense, restore poetry. In that sense, for me, it's about restoring the harmony. Uh, so taking an existing piece of something and restoring the harmony of it again. And how to do that? I, I brought to some organizations, uh, in a way, two, two ways to do that. First of all, reimagine your scrum. And reimagine your scrum in order to reemerge the structures around it. Because that sort of blindly uh, copy pasting what other people are doing was really not working. So and 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 that all came together because reimagine your scrum in a way is is is, is uh, a combination of two intermixed, intertwined, intermingled, whatever two big feedback loops. One is about reimagining your scrum. And and I call it reimagining your scrum, but do it one product at a time. Because in those agile transformations, organizations sort of wanted all of their teams to adopt Scrum over the weekend, let's say. Uh, on Friday, they went home, non-Scrum teams. On Monday, they came back and they were supposed to be Scrum teams. And they all had to apply the same practices, all had to work in sprints of two weeks with all of their sprints starting and ending on the same date. 
And that totally baffled me. And it was not working. It was not delivering results. It was not delivering the benefits that I believe Scrum could and should and can deliver. So I asked them, so let's take a step back and let's have a look at one instance of Scrum. And let's see what is the product that you're trying to deliver here. And let's have a look at that product. Be very clear that we know the product because in the end, in that paper in 2020, I already described product as the vehicle of value. It's the vehicle through which we try to deliver value. Yeah? So knowing your product is really important because I've seen a lot of companies just establishing scrum teams um, within silos, within departments, uh, without anybody taking care of sort of the overarching product that all those individual teams were working on. And once you know your product, and I believe I believe uh, Maddie Iqbal from, from Scrum Day Madison uh, in, in a few weeks will we'll be sharing a talk about uh, knowing your product and how important that is. So that's really cool. Yeah? So know your product. Start with product first because you have to organize your Scrum for your product, not organize your Scrum within the existing uh, ways of, of organizing and, and uh, working within the organization. Start with product then organize your scrum for that so that you can grow towards delivering what I call tasty sashimi slices of your product regularly. Things that people can, can taste, that they can digest, that they love, that they uh, love to uh, uh, live on. Yeah? But then, that is already a very difficult step, reimagining your scrum, uh, taking that step back. But the purpose in the end should be to reemerge the structures, the organization around scrum so that you can optimize for value. And, and let me take you through that today. That's sort of what I would like to focus on, that second feedback loop, that uh, reorganizing things. But in the end, this, what I call reversification or reverse value organization, that is what I nowadays call moving your scrum downfield. And I don't know if you notice it, but with regards to the title of that paper, I've added a little nuance in that sense. I've added your between brackets. Why? Because I believe and I think we all should participate in shaping Scrum, in moving our Scrum instances downfield so that collectively, bottom up, we will start moving Scrum as a movement, a global movement downfield. And what I mean with moving downfield is making progress, going forward, meaning downfield means towards our goals, our ambitions. And we are not fighting another team, obviously, like in a, in a scrummy rugby, but we are fighting bureaucracy, latency, delays, uh, heavy processes, governance. We are fighting burnouts of people. We are fighting inhumane treatment of people and so on. And it's time that we start moving our scrum downfield to really, really make progress. And it starts by understanding why are you in the end implementing scrum? Because Scrum cannot be the purpose of Scrum. Don't implement Scrum because of Scrum. Do it for a reason. Know your why. And that's part of that, that, that idea of reversification also. Um, so, but to go back to the, the essence of Scrum in, in that paper again, 2020, moving your Scrum downfield, the first version already, I call Scrum as a definition and a pinnacle framework that enables people to derive value from complex challenges. And I all know, I hope we all in, understand that software development is certainly a complex challenge. Uh, new product development is certainly a complex challenge, a complex challenge. Uh, so complexity is why we need empiricism. It's also why we need people, why we need self-organizing people, why we need to thrive on collective intelligence. But in the end, for me, the purpose of Scrum is value, delivering value. And why is that so important? Because uh, a lot of companies, even the, the, the ones that are uh, adopting Scrum, haven't shifted yet from volume-oriented thinking to a value-oriented thinking. And volume is like manufacturing. It's like mass, mass production. That's not what Scrum or Agile is about. That was the industrial paradigm. That's from the previous century. Just to say that sort of the underlying thinking under why people are doing Scrum hasn't always changed. If they're just using Scrum to do more, faster, whatever, get more features out on the market, that is a volume thinking, that is the sort of thinking you would apply on machines or uh, 
industrial manufacturing, but not in a in a in a creative complex uh, world uh, of Scrum. So if you think about the purpose of Scrum, Scrum cannot be the purpose of Scrum. In the end, value is the purpose of Scrum. And as I said, product is the vehicle to deliver value. So know your product because your product will be the vehicle through which you will deliver value. And if you still want to think about product, think about in terms of it might be a good, it might be a product, it might be a service, it might be a digital service. It can be, in other words, can be tangible, it can be non-tangible. It can be potentially product being the outcome of some sort of bounded process or set of actions. That's all fine. That is what a product is. But in Scrum terms, a product is supposed to deliver value and not just value in general, but value to the consumers of the product. A product has consumers, people that have to use it, have to consume it, that have to uh, apply it to, to solve uh, certain problems or issues, uh, issues to help them in their professional life or their personal life. So for me, in Scrum terms, a product is only a product if it delivers value to the consumers of the product. To overcome this idea of uh, component-oriented thinking and, and little applications hidden somewhere deep in the organization, and then uh, we fool ourselves uh, massively by saying, yeah, yeah, but this is a product too. Yeah, it's not a product if you're not um, building it uh, start to finish or not delivering end-to-end -end value to the consumers. So think about when you want to know your product, important, because if you want to organize and reorganize and optimize for value, then you have to start with product because product is a vehicle to deliver value. And this is just some sort of silly justification. If you think this is really no, it's not really. Um, already, I remember 20, 2011, which is a, a long, long time ago, uh, 12 years and a half, um, there was a beta version, a first trial version of a, a new class uh, that we were building at Scrum the Talk. It was called a professional Scrum product owner class. Up to that point, Scrum the Talk had a PSM class and a PSD class. And in that class already, the central theme, the core theme was value, period. It's all about value. And that was just to overcome by that time the idea of a product owner being the one writing out user stories, eh, converting requirements of, of, of uh, people into user stories and then showing that over to the developers to have them do that. That was not really what we were looking for. And even longer ago, the Agile Manifesto already said it in, in its uh, first principle, our highest priority is to satisfy them through valuable software. Not just software, but valuable software. It doesn't say to early and continuous delivery of more software. It says continuous delivery of valuable software. So that's really, value has always been at the heart of, of, of Agile and of Scrum. So first step of re-emerging structures around Scrum to optimize value is what I call ARM for value. And to ARM is an acronym. Now, how to do that? What do I mean with how to ARM for value? Meaning ARM for value, assume value first. In that sense, um, organize your product backlog, order your product backlog, add items in your product backlog against the assumption that this is going to deliver value. That these are the most valuable, that this is the most valuable work to do right now. Order for that, be dynamic, make sure that always the highest, uh, the highest value items are always high on your product backlog. So make that assumption of value. You could say anticipate value, that's also an A. You could say assign value uh, on your product backlog. I like assume because it's an assumption, because you will never know whether it's really valuable what you're doing unless you release. Just building your product backlog around value and then uh, the, uh, creating increments without releasing them, it will still keep you blindfolded. You will still not have any ID. So you have to release. And what do you release in Scrum? Increments. Increments are output. Eh? But we want to move from output to outcome. So you don't just want to release in the market. You want to capture what, what the effect is of your work, what the impact is of your work on the market. So in that sense, talking about closing the loops, you want to close the feedback loop with your users or your consumers. Otherwise, you still have no idea. 
If you're uh, building an increment and you're sending it to the testing department or the release department, you have no idea. You're not closing the feedback loop with your users. You're just postponing the release. You're postponing the ability to close that feedback loop. Doesn't make, make sense. And keep doing that. Sprint after sprint after sprint. Keep producing increments that you assume are going to be value and then validate or invalidate your assumption of value by measuring, by measuring the outcome, the impact that you have. And that's an important shift to move from output to outcome. From creating increments and releasing them to measuring, capturing the, the impact that you have with your work. So that is what I call to arm for value. So know your product so that you can uh, think about your users, your consumers, and think about what will they appreciate, what will be most valuable for them. And then work with that. And if you want to think about value, because value is a very generic word, it's a general word. If you want to want to have some ideas around thinking about uh, value, I always start with uh, thinking in terms of value for whom? Who are we trying to serve? Who For whom are we trying to create value? And obviously it starts, I think, I hope that is a very logical thing. It starts with the consumers of your product, of your service, or uh, the thing that you're creating. Huh? They want to get value out of it, meaning they want to get benefits out of it. They want to have a happier life. They want to be able to do their work uh, more easily. Um, they want to have some value out of it. Obviously, uh, you want to produce value for what I call the sponsors, your sponsors, the people within the organization, people representing the organization that are sponsoring you, that are funding you, that are making sure that you can, that as a team, you can do your work. So they want to have value out of the work too. And then not to forget, because I think the first two ones, consumers and sponsors, whatever you call them, I think they are very, very obvious and almost too obvious. In that sense, imagine you have really happy customers or consumers. Imagine you have really happy sponsors, but imagine you have really unhappy teams, the people doing the work, which I call the creators. That makes no sense. It makes no sense to have happy consumers, happy sponsors, but that we keep burning out our teams, our workforce all the time. That our people keep leaving the company, keep resigning or wanting to move to another team or another department, whatever, but not here. Makes no sense that at least those three should be in balance. In that sense, the adoption of Scrum should also be valuable for the people doing the work. So for the people consuming the work, for the people sponsoring the work, but also for the people doing the work. So that is important. And you know what? The funny thing is, that's where it starts, but it doesn't have to end there. I was, I've been talking about this a lot with organizations, and at some point in time, um, at, at some session, after the session, uh, a lady in the Netherlands approached me and said, hey, Gunther, what about value for the environment? What about value for the planet? Let's not just be so uh, hyper-commercial about it. And let's also think, and that's a really good idea, let's think or rethink our position as an organization, as an enterprise in the world, in society, um, and, and on the planet even. And, and what if we would... Not just try to deliver value to the consumers, to the sponsors, and even to the creators, but also make sure that we um, deliver value, that we make something that is beneficial to the planet, to the society, to society too. So it starts certainly with the first three one, but it doesn't have to stop there. And 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 certainly on on the last thing, um, you know, environmental uh, impact really important uh, these days, and it will only get worse look at what's happening at the at the uh, large conference uh, somewhere in the middle east right now um the it sector has a role to play yeah? um the it sector as a whole has the the the, the footprint in terms of uh, um I got to say like i feel it is damaging the planet uh, we have the footprint of of an average country at least. And it's increasing, and it's uh, not just linearly increasing, but it's exponentially increasing. We all know that software is everywhere. We thrive on software. We've got uh, service all over the world. We've got software. We use machines. We need electricity, whatever. Think about the impact we can have as an IT sector. 
So this is a call to action. Now that lady that I talked about was called Marjolein Pilon. You might see her name on the screen. Um, I got her in touch with Scrum to Talk with Dave West, our CEO of Scrum to Talk. They had a cool talk about it. Uh, that was published as an interview on the website of Scrum to Talk. Um, you can look up things. I've seen that uh, uh, companies like uh, Microsoft with Azure, even, even Amazon with the Amazon Web Services and so on, are really focusing on this more and more and more. So there is growing awareness that as IT people, we can actually help the planet by trying to reduce our, our uh, footprint, the impact we have as IT uh, people and with our uh, services and, and applications and uh, infrastructure on the world. Yeah, so think about it. But if you don't want to know about arming for value, so assign value, assume value, anticipate for value, uh, release often, and then you want to measure. So you want to work with value. You want to organize your product backlog for to deliver value to consumers, to uh, stakeholders, sponsors, and, and even to the planet. And then you want to know, how are we, are we actually successful? Are we actually delivering value to those uh, parties, let's say? And then you want to think about value for your consumers. And you might think about parameters like customer satisfaction or user satisfaction. I don't know, user retention, um, uh, usage of your systems, a uh, number of visits, uh, potentially market share for sponsors, often a lot, certainly in commercial organizations or for-profit organizations, they will be mostly interested in something with money, in that sense, revenues, profits, uh, sales, increased sales, whatever, maybe hurting the competition sometimes in this, uh, in this uh, beautiful, <laughs> ugly world that we live in. Um, value for the creators, the people doing the work in the sense of engagement, energy, um, a decrease in turnover of people, people not leaving the company anymore, the ability to hire like really uh, new, great new people again, high, high potentials, um, decrease in absenteeism, decrease in sickness, in burnouts, in depression rates, and so on. All signs that you might be delivering value uh, for the creators of the product. And for the environment, you want to think in terms of uh, power consumption, uh, exhaust, and so on. Uh, there are really great ways to think about this. So in general, how to improve, uh, how to increase sustainability. Yeah. So so think about that. Uh, and, and the same to put it differently. So um, question one, are you actually creating value? Are you delivering value? You can measure that. So by arming for it, uh, in the end, you can measure that with parameters like uh, on the screen. Now, I want, I, want to, I want to point out that these are just samples. Huh? Think about value for your product, your, your consumers in your organization and your part of the organization. What would you call value and how would you measure that? So think about it. These are just examples of, of uh, potential indicators, uh, metrics that you can have in place. Satisfaction, usage of your systems, something with financial returns, something with engagement of the teams and so on. Now, for me, agility uh, and, and, and being agile and, and even in the Agile Manifesto, certainly in Scrum, but in the, even in the Agile Manifesto, Agile was all about delivering valuable software to your users and your consumers. So agility means being able to sustain your value creation, being able to create value, not just do more, not just do it quicker, but do the right stuff, build it in the right way, the right stuff meaning the stuff that brings value, that is appreciated, that brings money, that brings benefits, not just doing more. Now, that's only the first part of the story. I believe that agility should also be about discovering new value. Again, new value for uh, the, the consumers, the sponsors, the creators, and, and even the planet or society. So, and, and how can you potentially measure that you're delivering new value? Uh, by looking at your products. How many new features are you building into your products? How many new ideas are you actually actually adding to your products? How many old features that nobody uses are, are you getting out of it and replacing it with new features? Same at the product portfolio level. How many great, uh, exciting new products have you built over the past couple of years? Rather than just updating, tweaking existing products and tweaking existing features within existing products and so on. Uh, so, so that should be what Agile is also about, 
not being sure that you have a high actual value, but you're also able to discover new value, new sources of value, so that you keep innovating, that you can keep moving on, uh, that you can discover new products. Yeah? And agility should be uh, sustaining that. So, so introducing Scrum should help you free up energy and time of people to think about new stuff and not just continue that rat race of, of, of tweaking and, and updating and maintain, maintaining the old stuff fighting technical debt all the time and so on. Yeah? And agility can be measured in parameters like how much code do you have in your system that is actually not being used? And how about getting that code out? By the way, that is also one of the things that will help you reduce the power consumption of your systems. The same with unused parts of databases and so on. You have no idea, but that actually takes energy. Now, it's not just impeding blocking you in 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 uh adding stuff and discovering new stuff but it's also uh, not helpful for the planet let's say so think about there are a number of metrics so think about are you actually delivering value how can you measure that and what is your ability to uh deliver new so new ways of of value and that's a very different way of thinking. Uh, but as usual, whenever you talk about metrics or measurements, um, the biggest danger, we all know that, and certainly, again, that's a, the industrial way of looking at things, when a measurement becomes a target, an objective, something that you need to achieve. And then we all know that there's some sort of uh, uh, good heart law on that, saying that as soon as you uh, start making, uh, start turning a metric into a target, it totally loses its meaning. It becomes pointless because you know how we human, human beings are. Give us a target. And certainly if you would tie uh, money or bonuses or incentives to, in, uh, into that, whatever happens, we will make the target. Even if you have to lie for that or cheat or whatever, and then you lose transparency, you lose it, the, you lose the value of the measurement. It will not help you. Yeah. And think about in this, in this uh, dynamic and, and world full of change, uh, you want to keep doing this over and over again. You want to include this in your iterative incremental process so that you look beyond singular data points and look at trend lines and patterns. Uh, and that will help you uh, get an idea of how you're doing rather than just overly focusing on one uh, single set of, of, of data points. Yeah. And think about in, in terms of your product life cycle, uh, as your product grows and matures and changes and, 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 and evolves and, and maybe expands or shrinks again, uh, the, the, the definition of value might, might be changing. So keep that in mind too. Again, the idea of inspection adaptation applied on your definition of value. Now, that is not enough. This is arming for value. How to arm for value? Assign value, release so that you can measure the impact and you can shift from uh, outcome, uh, from output, sorry, to outcome. But that's not near enough. Why? Because it's in a way still measuring things is still inspection. It's capturing data. It's capturing information uh, based on uh, metrics or observations that you have, uh, discussions that you have, feedback that you have received, that you will see from your consumer base, um, inspection without adaptation is pointless. That applies to the events in Scrum, that applies to the daily Scrum, that applies to the sprint review. If you're only at those events uh, talking about sort of the inspections, meaning the past, then it turns into status meetings, updates, justifications, and so on. That's not the point. The point of all those events, including the overarching event, the container event or sprint, is to have uh, our eyes on the future looking back in order to think, shape the future. That is what the adaptation part is about. If you're going through those events and, and organizing work in sprints without the ambition to use it to adapt, that's pointless. It will not help with regards to the waterfall uh, way of working. Yeah? And that's where your arming for value uh, turns into what I call an armada of value. To arm for value, assume, release, measure, and then adapt to your insights. Use your insights, use your measurements to adapt to them. Again, this goes back to the empirical process. And again, the importance of transparency. Your assumptions will be validated or invalidated. The fact that your assumptions are invalidated is really important information. So you want to accept that, you want to embrace that, 
you want the user to learn from it and do things differently. If it's a target and whatever happens, we will achieve our target, then uh, uh, transparency will be uh, totally lost. So in, in adapting um, for value, adapting upon those insights, one um, part that indeed could be adapted is what I call your scrum zone, meaning the combination of the scrum teams uh, organized around a product. Because that measurement is the inspection, but you want to do an adaptation. You want to have a look at the skills of people, the formation of the teams, are the teams correctly formed? Are they actually delivering an actual releasable increment? Is it completely done? Um, do they? Uh, what practices do they apply? Uh, what tools do they have? What systems do they have? Do they have access to systems? Do they have authorizations to systems? Can they organize their own testing? Whatever, uh, think about all those things. Those are the things you should look at at adaptation. So if, if your actual value is not what you hoped it would be, have a look at those things. How are we working? Uh, how are the scrum teams working? How, we can, how can we facilitate them even more? And there's lots of things that you can think about. And, and what was so, in a way, um, sad in all those agile transformations, that this was not the focus of people. This was the people uh, driving or, or organizing those agile transformations, managing them, whatever, imposing things on people. It was not about how committed, how focused, how engaged are our people? How are our teams working together? Are they, do, can they truly organize their own work? Uh, do they have goals and boundaries within which to self-organize? Do they have the skills? What practices do they apply? Do they have all those things? Are we actually helping them by removing impediments? Are, they actually, are we actually not asking them to do uh, low value stuff and so on? So there's lots of ways this is something, this is a list I, I, I compiled, I think around 2015. I call it maximizing your scrum. There are many ways to maximize your scrum without adding people, without adding teams, without um, lots of other things. And, and that goes back to this idea of, of these agile transformations where you have this large, certainly large, but this, this, this picture sadly also applies to a lot of uh, medium-sized and even small uh, organizations, unfortunately, uh, organized in silos with layers of, of, of uh, management and whatever on top of them. And then they go to an agile transformation. And what do they do? They combine individuals into teams. And then they often have like small micro teams operating within the boundaries of, of departments and, and those silo structures that we have in place. And that's where you run into problems because a team in Scrum for me is, is my definition of a team is not just a group of people. It's a group of people, a cross-functional collective of people that work against a shared purpose. And that shared purpose which is creating valuable increments of product. Again, this idea of product comes back. Uh, so it's not about creating components of a product or sub parts of a product or little little interfaces of a product. No, it's, it's creating end-to-end uh, -end valuable increments of a product. So in that sense, establishing teams within those silos and departments, those are not teams for me. A team means it's focused on a product. So it's not, it's not people working together based upon governance and meetings and who should be doing what and, and contracts and handovers and so on. What uh, unites people in a team is product, working for a product. And a product has consumers, uh, the, the, the little, little pictures on, on, on uh, outside of the organization. And a product has a product owner. And whether that product owner comes from business IT, I couldn't care less, the best placed person to manage that product, to manage that product end to end. And then in order to deliver valuable increments of a product, it's not enough to have people from certain departments in it only. You need to have people from different departments in it. And that's already where you run into problems, but because this is where you get this sort of, um, these conflicts with existing organizational structures. And you know what? Delivering valuable increments of a product often requires more than just IT skills. You might need product management skills, business analyst skills, or functional, whatever, user research people. And then all facilitated by a Scrum Master. And that is a team. 
And that is the problem. You can't establish a team within existing silos and departments. But in all those agile transformations that I've seen, at least, people thought it could be. They limited sort of, oh, yeah, Scrum, that is for the teams. Oh, yeah, we need teams. Let's let's uh, form people into teams. But you know what? Let's not give up on hierarchy and line management and so on. That is not possible. To get more out of Scrum, we need to challenge that idea, start with product, and then make sure we have the right expertise and skills in the team to deliver done versions of that product. So in that sense, the definition of done for the product should define what expertise and skills you have in the team. And that sounds easy, but in practice, it seems to be the other way around. It seems to be that the uh, availability of people and skills in the team defines the definition of done. But it shouldn't be because it's the other way around. It should start with quality and then get the expertise and the skills in the team. By the way, this is also implementation of that these ideas from the new new product development game. Have a challenge, an objective, something in mind, something that needs to be built, a product that needs to be built, created, and so on. Make sure you bring all the expertise and the skills uh, around that product and then get out of the way, ask them to do their job. We've added empiricism to that. So this is for me a team in Scrum. And this seems to be a problem because it, it will have an impact on the organizational structures. But it doesn't have to end there. Ultimately, you don't just want to adapt your scrum zone, but you might want to adapt the organization for success. And that is essential for me currently, as I believe we are sort of uh, entering this uh, fourth wave of scrum, meaning also that tornado phase of the technology option life cycle. In that tornado phase, there are opportunities to use that new established product, that gorilla product, that Gorilla offering to really build on it and rethink how we work. And how I see that in terms of Scrum and adapting the organization, I feel like starting with what I call a product hub. So we have already identified, so establishing a Scrum team around the product is going to go across all those uh, internal organizational barriers that we have in place. So let's start with product. A product, on a product, we need to do different things. We need to deliver the product, obviously. You have to promote it, sell it, uh, think about strategies or pricing strategies. I don't know, subscription models, think about the financial aspects of the problem, do user research, do competitive research and so on. Lots of things need to happen around for a product. Now, the product owner, for me, should be at the heart of the product. Whether the product owner is from business, IT, uh, former sales, product manager, I don't care. In a way, in, in for me, in a world of Scrum, the, the, the professional life of product owner revolves around the product. Not a department, not some sort of line, whatever, but the product. Um, for me, essentially, and that's a good start, um, developers, or what we used to call the development teams, you would use Scrum to deliver the product to create increments of that product and release them into the market so that you can capture the impact of your product. That's where you, that's where Scrum was born. That's where Scrum is really great. That's where Scrum, where it is, uh, let's say, obvious to use Scrum. But although you would only use Scrum and the Scrum process, um, building on the six essential traits, to deliver the product, still the product owner has a broader role to play, not just be part of the delivery of the product, but be the be the connection, being uh, the, creating the bridge between all those uh, things that need to happen for a product and then connect that to the, to the Scrum team. Yeah? Now, within the organization, you've got stakeholders, you've got subject matter experts, people that can help you with certain expertise, certain insights that you probably need to, uh, to develop the product. Yeah. And in a way, in a product hub, um, all those parties would be uh, pulled towards the product, not be in their silos, not be in their department, but form a hub, a product hub, meaning a sort of organizational unit around the product. And in that organizational unit, whether they all do Scrum or not, in this picture they don't, it's just the delivery part that's doing Scrum. Whether they all do Scrum or not, I don't care, but they should be um, part of the product, part of that little organizational unit within the organization. 
so that you can uh, move fast, make decisions, no delays, so that if you have to do marketing, then it's marketing for this product specifically, and that you organize that work as, as part of that product hub. And in that sense, that product hub is, is an implementation of things that um, were set in that old paper, 1986, the new new product development game. In that sense, you create a little startup within the organization that they set their own initiative, they set their own agenda, they make, they plan their own work, all for the product, where management actually becomes what I call that sponsor, sponsoring you, making sure that you can do your job, um, but in the end, getting out of the way. So that is that is almost literally quote 1986 from the new new product development team to get more out of your scrum already. They said that this is what should be happening. And I've just expanded it to my product job. And to give you an idea of that difficulty of, of picturing that on a, on a traditional organization, we already know team goes across lots of organizational structures that we have in place. A product hub makes it even worse because we've got stakeholders within the organization. We've got subject matter experts within the organization. They may, may be business people, IT people, they may be uh, traditional management people, part of leadership and whatever. And in a product hub, you want to bring those people together around the product in a new organizational uh, construction, let's say. And that is the difficulty. Um, let me first say there's two ways to look at a product hub, how to use Scrum within the product hub. The first model is, is I think, uh, the best model to start with, uh, with a, a product on the heart of the product, uh, using Scrum to deliver the product, and then um, the whole thing, the whole ecosystem uh, facilitated by a Scrum Master or Scrum Masters. But if you really want to apply Scrum everywhere, I'm totally okay with that. But that means you would organize all of the other activities also in Scrum teams using sprints um, and contributing to delivering uh, valuable increments of the product. Doesn't mean they have to be in one Scrum team, can be separate Scrum teams, but they have to uh, organize them, their sprints then uh, towards building valuable increments of the product. That's the more difficult thing, but I want to look, um, I, I look far into the future, let's say. But in the end, re-emerging the structures around Scrum, meaning adapting the organization for value by forming product hubs. Remember again, products, the vehicle to deliver value. That means we make we, we put product front and center in everything we do, delivering it, promoting it, selling it, uh, funding it, sponsoring it, uh, following up on, on the financial aspects and, and, and the uh, impact that we have, the value aspects, that meaning putting product front and center. That means gradually, and that's part of this, by doing this product by product by product, first of all, reimagine your Scrum for that product and then rethinking the structures around that instance of Scrum to further optimize for better. That means taking a little part of that pyramid structure and turning into a product and another part into a product until in the end, <clears throat> you've reformed gradually, iteratively, incrementally, reformed the current organization into a networked structure of product hubs that are connected not by not so much by pure hierarchy or pure command and control, but by purpose. Why do we even exist as a company? What is our purpose? What is our mission as a company? And I believe as we are entering the tornado phase that the organizations that will get the most out of Scrum will be the organizations that have the courage and the willingness and the eagerness, even the openness that sense the urgency to really start updating, changing, adapting the organization. But it's going to require courageous Scrum Masters, whatever place of the universe they come from, to challenge what we are doing with Scrum. Because so far we have moved from massive use of waterfall now to sort of almost massive use of Scrum. But it's still this, 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 this yeah, compliancy or this, I don't know, people holding back. We can do so much better. And this is the part where I need to apologize because we're close to the end of the time box. And uh, this is the part that I felt, oh my God, um, reversify or moving your Scrum downfield actually consists of three big feedback loops. 
we know first big feedback loop, reimagine your scrum, product by product by product. Yeah? That is connected to reemerging the structures around, the, around those instances of scrum. Yeah? So, so two feedback loops that are connected to each other. What I think is also really important is to use that implementation, that adoption of Scrum to humanize the workplace, to re-energize people. Meaning think about what makes people feel valued? What motivates people? How can we restore motivation of people? Uh, how can we show that, that, that thing, take it to the team? When in doubt, when you're not sure about things, even I hope you also realize that as a Scrum Master, Take it to the team. Um, a collection of people, a collection of brains that can really help you. And in the end, engagement is the key. You can uh, optimize your scrum, whatever. If if you are, if you if you will not find a way to re-engage and re-energize people, it's not going to help anyhow. If we if we just use scrum to keep up the rat race and and hold on to that, it's not going to happen. So think about it. Now, I've been talking about this also past couple of years about engagement being the key. So you can look that up even on my YouTube channel and so on. But think about it. What motivates people? What makes people feel valued? How can we restore engagement of people? Because in the end, if people are really engaged, they will care about team outcomes. They will care about the customer. They will care about the enterprise. You don't even have to demand that. Create an organization where uh, people find their engagement again. Thank so, you. Thank you. So that was my almost full story. It was sort of the full story, <laughs> except for the last part. That's very, that's very. Um, you know, we just have a few minutes left, so let me take care of just a couple of housekeeping things. That, Gunther, will you be willing to supply your your deck? Uh, and a yes, PDF of course. to send send out yeah. to people. Um, yeah, I think they like that. And then the other question is, we have we have several questions. Um, I'm putting you on the spot here, but would you be willing to answer some of them asynchronously if I send them to you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. and you can send that back to me. They're not hopefully not hard questions. Um, yeah, but if, if 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 they are, I will make sure that I I will answer with a better question. <laughs> so, so our first question um, came very early on, and there are, there have been so many blogs and opinions centered around the failure of Agile and Scrum. Um, you know, even you know, even making managers Scrum masters, for example. What what do you what are your thoughts on on that topic? Yeah, it's a good one. Can I, uh, I quickly want to go back to my, my presentation, if, if you're okay with that, and quickly go back to something very early on. So keep with me. Uh, so I ended my, my book in 2013 with that statement about the future of Scrum. I still believe in that. But I see people thinking that we are already there and we are not. So if, if I, in my book I said... Uh, sorry for the thing. If I said the future state of Scrum will no longer be called Scrum. So I say what we now call Scrum will have become the norm and organizations have emerged around it. The problem today is that what people now call Scrum is not Scrum. They think it's the norm, it's the standard way of working. What we now call Scrum is not even Scrum, let alone that we have even started rethinking the organization around it. And then and then that's that's in a way, in a way sad it sort of breaks my heart because um we can do so much more with scrum but that's sort of the downside of success of scrum whatever people a lot of organizations call scrum is not even close to what scrum is designed to be they just use the names and the terminology but that's about yeah, it yeah and then and then when it doesn't work they want to blame it on scrum when it's yeah when yeah it's and that's the same with with, with that, that movement from uh, moving individuals into teams without touching the organization around it, it's never going to help. It is impossible to implement Scrum, to adopt Scrum without having an impact on all those things. How you work with people, how you review them, HR procedures, how you fund work. There's so much, uh, the processes, the governance or whatever, the, the focus of people by not uh, the multitasking thing, multi-projecting people and so on by, by changing all of that. So, so yeah, 
I see people say, okay, we're there. Scrum, Scrum is every. Yeah, but it's not even close to what Scrum is designed to be as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And I think it's it's time to start stand up. That's why I'm talking about this. This is not something that um, massive amounts of people will get. Yeah, I'm very aware of that, that we need to move forward. It's essentially a, a mindset shift again, right? So. Yeah, from, from that industrial mindset, volume oriented thinking to that HR mindset, people, right. value, yeah, discovery. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. Um, this actually comes from a member of our leadership team, Joe. Um, by the way, uh, thank you um, to our leadership team that's here today. Anu, Marco, Jeff, Joe, and Ange. Uh, appreciate you guys can wave to everybody, but we see the, the nice picture in your background. But Joe asked, uh, how about the value for the organization? He said, I believe that an organization that becomes good at quote or in parentheses, their scrum learns how to learn faster and thus increases its ability to pivot fast, um, becomes more resilient. Yeah, that, that is absolutely true. But it it, it also it implies a, a sort of shift in a, a, a lot of leadership or management people. Um, let me give an example. Uh, what, what I've seen, certainly in Belgium, and I think in a lot of European countries, I don't know about the US, but certainly in Europe, um, after the corona crisis, um, everybody's now being called back to the office. Although a lot of people shown and demonstrated that they can be trusted and so on, that they still, none of those companies went bankrupt because people had to work from home. But certainly people start pulling them back calling them back to the office. And the only reason why they do that is because a lot of people on those management layers, their only reason of existing is controlling other people, not bringing value. So they just exist out and they, so they want all those people back because otherwise they lose sort of the reason of existence. Yeah? So that in itself is already a huge shift in, in what we are looking for. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting. It's sort of a metaphor as an answer. Yeah. 